Why live a normal life when you could be living the abundant life? Welcome to the Abundant Life Program with Ashley and Carly Terrades. Hello and welcome to Abundant Life. We're so glad you joined us today in the lounge. Praise God. We've got a great program for you today. So we're excited. We've got some great things to teach you today and to share with you today. Amen. Amen. So what are we looking at today, Carly? Today we're looking at um, uh, the beginning of a new series. Okay. Right. And but today specifically we're talking about God's man. Now, if you're a woman, don't tune out. Don't think, you know, this is not for me. Right. God's man. God picked us. Did you're you saying know God's that? God's person. God's, God's person. person rather than God's man. I'm not PC. I'm not going to get all politically correct. Okay. God, God's, God's man. Person. <laughs> oh my goodness. The point is God chose us. There have been plenty of times when I can think about just, just growing up where, especially at sports events, right? right. Have you ever, were you ever there on the, on the field in school where they'd pick captains, team captains? Oh, I hate that. When they, that and was that, awful. What, what happened is they choose people. Yeah, that would be bad. Then pick, pick, pick. And then the people at the end would feel like, oh, we'll just take those. And it got really bad, like when they're choosing teams. They'd say, like, you know, we don't even, you just have him. You don't, we don't even want him. Oh, when you when you get down to the dregs at the <laughs> you end. You felt really, yeah, you felt really type of valued then. In fact, we was playing the other day with the, with the kids, and they said, let's pick ta- captains and let's let's have you choose teams. And I'm like, no, don't go there because I can imagine these <laughs> these kids at the end who get chose last or chosen last. Someone's gonna be, always devastated. They're going to be crying. So yeah, so we just said, let's just split them. Exactly. In fact, and they actually said, let's have the old people against the young people. So I started kids walking. Against adults. I started walking towards the young people. And I forgot that oh, no, I'm, honey. now I'm on the old no, you've, side. You've crossed over crossed the other over. side now. I know. Anyway, so carry on. So God's man. So I remember Persons. being there um, as a teenager, especially going through high school, when the team captains are there picking picking sides. And, you know, I've always been sure it's, it's not a new thing, right? You're vertically, you're vertically challenged. No, I'm I just built for travel. Built for travel. Every I'm seat, compact. Every seat, you, every seat she sits in the, in the in an airplane is like first class. She has lots of leg room. She never has to complain about that. I love room. it. It's awesome, right? God just made me perfect for travel. And uh, but but because of that, I was always one of the last people to be picked. And growing up, I was like, man, I just wish that I could be taller. Or I wish that I could be stronger. Or I wish that I didn't have red hair because I used to get picked on at school. They used to say, you know, you're like a, you're like a battery. You've been left out in the rain to rust. Oh, Kids really are nice. so mean. They will always find something about you that's different to pick on. And, you know, at first, when I was younger, it really bothered me. Um, and now they have all these anti-bullying things, right? Well, when we were at school, it was just like, you just tough it out. Just get on with it. <laughs> Suck it up, honey, and off you go, right? You're not against, just to clarify, you're not against the anti-bullying <laughs> I'm things. I'm not. You're just but saying in our them. day, <laughs> we didn't have them. I'm just, just making sure that people know that, that we're, you know, we didn't have we're not them. for bullying. We're just saying that in our day, it was, we didn't have the anti-bullying Now programs. you sound really old. I know. In our day. Back in our day. Back in our day. You know, but, but here's the thing. When we start to compare ourselves among ourselves, the scripture says that we're not wise. And it's easy to look at our own failings, at our own shortcomings, our own misgivings and think, well, you know, if, if, I could, if only I could lose 100 pounds, if only I could be a bit stronger, if only I was a bit taller or a bit skinnier or, or a bit smarter, or if only I'd gone to college and, and got that, that qualification that I, that, or, or completed a course or done something. If only I'd married a different person, if only my kids were more well-behaved, whatever. There's always things in our life when we start to look in ourselves that we can pick holes in. And there, there is nothing, e- no one easier to do this with than with ourselves because we're very aware of our own failings, right? However much we try and, and cover them up, we know where our inadequacies are. And what I want to show you today is you don't have to be perfect for God to pick you. Amen. That's a good job. That's a, that's, that's a good, do- that's, that's, that's that's a good that's job. That's a good right truth, there. praise God. I'm that's glad, a good I'm God. glad about that, praise God. If, it was, if God only chose perfect people, we'd be in trouble. In fact, there's only one person, per- perfect person who's ever walked the earth, and that's Jesus. So Amen. every person who's ever worked for the Lord, New Testament, Old Testament, every pick your Bible hero, pick your modern day hero, every single person God's ever chosen has, is imperfect. So you've got that in common with them. Amen. In fact, if you look through the scriptures, there's a catalogue of failures right there in people's lives that you can learn from. The people that God used throughout scripture, they weren't perfect. They didn't have it all together. They weren't the best at anything, but they were people with the right heart. And when I look at this scripture, this is in John 15, 16. It says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. God picked you and he says, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. God picked us to be a success. 
You know, he's never made a duffer yet and he didn't start with you. At the end of the day, he hasn't picked us because of, of our accolades or our experience or our charismatic personality or, you know, our, our great list of accomplishments. He picked us because we are made in his image. And God sees us differently to what the world sees us. And this is something where I want to focus today because, you know, when we start to look at ourselves only in the natural man, only by our flesh, by our talents, by our abilities, by our experience, you know, we are missing out on the part of us that God sees. And in 1 Samuel 6 verse 7, can you, you look that one up? 1 um, Samuel, this is 16 verse 7. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find it as well here. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not, do not look at the physical appearance uh, or his physical stature. Good job they didn't look at your physical stature, I guess. Right, <laughs> exactly. Your physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That is First uh, Samuel 16, 7. Good verse. And this was so important because, you know, um, this, this is jumping right into the middle of when um, Samuel the prophet came to pick the king of Israel. And Jesse had, had a whole host of sons that he, he brought out before the prophet. And Samuel was there and he went all the way through them and said, hang a second. Do you not have some more sons? Are there not some other sons? And, you know, you go on down to read in this passage here. The, um, in verse 10 it says, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Now these were strong, strong, mighty men, but he hadn't chosen any of those. Verse 11, and Samuel said to Jesse, are all of the young men here? You know he's in trouble at this point. You, right? know, you know Samuel's a prophet, right? Because yeah. Jesse's <laughs> everyone brought, was afraid of him. <laughs> Jesse's brought all his sons out. So there's all his seven sons. He lines up his seven sons. Samuel goes through the seven. You'd think by the time he got to the last son, he was like, Lord, this must be the one. This is the last son. But then he's like, no, there's, there's someone else outside of here. So that shows you what a prophet Samuel was. I mean, he could see there was someone else even outside of um, who who Jesse presented. So Jesse must have felt bad then. Like, oh yeah, there was so, that, there's so that one son I left. <laughs> I didn't even bring him, to, I didn't stray. even nominate him. I didn't even let him be part of the, you know, I didn't even let him come yeah. and participate. He's uh, back in the he didn't back bring, full two. He didn't bring the runt of the litter out. Must, right? have, felt, <laughs> runt of the litter. must have felt really <laughs> valued. So. And this gives me hope anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, verse 11, Samuel said to Jesse, are all of the young men here? And then he said, there remains yet the youngest and there he is keeping the sheep. Man, David wasn't even invited to the party. He was left out on the back 40 looking out after the sheep. He wasn't even invited to come on in and meet the prophet, right? He's just the young sheep herder. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him for we will not sit down until he comes here. That must have been a little awkward. I like it. I think it's great. I mean, they didn't have like an ATV, you know, just hop on the ATV, go across the hills there and go and collect David. It, it could must have, have been took miles. some time. It must have took some time. Yeah. So have long, even if it was just 20 minutes or, or half an hour, it must have been pretty awkward. Everyone's just, just had to stand there. there waiting. That's like one the, of those awkward family reunions. Waiting for the youngest. Well, you know, the youngest <laughs> son, they probably, if it's anything like a normal family, the youngest son probably got picked on a lot and everything else. So you know, they all had to stand in honour and wait yeah. for the youngest son to come. He comes in smelling a sheep. Yeah. You know, he didn't go it. and shower and change. And you know, all the other all the other seven boys, they've scrubbed up, you know, they've trimmed their beards. Got themselves they've, looking nice. they've got themselves manicured. They've got the sheep poop off them. There's David fresh from the field, covered in, in muck probably. So I may be getting ahead of you here, but this just shows you God sees us wherever we are even yeah. if in the natural we're not in a position you know in the natural we're not in a position that it looks like we're going to be promoted or it looks like mm -hmm. God's God can see us wherever we are praise Amen. God he because saw he saw Joseph in the prison he saw you know he saw David here and keeping the sheep he, he see, saw, when God looks at us he sees our potential Amen. now that's huge because, you know, it gives us hope to know that good, we, are, we are very aware of our failings. We can, you know, sit down and talk about all, Ashley and I could, about all of the things that we've done wrong in our life. In fact, some of our stupid stories we do tell you because it makes you feel better about yourself. If we told you all, the, th all the times we got it wrong, <laughs> we would need a long, yeah, it'd be like a four hour show. <laughs> we could write a book on how to miss God. <laughs> how to miss God several times over. Yeah. How dumb can you be? <laughs> right. <laughs> But, but here's, the, here's the hope in this, is that God sees not our mistakes, but he sees our potential. He sees who he created us to be. And he has plans for our life that don't change just because we mess it up sometimes. This is, this is huge. So when God um, picked David out, he wasn't the brightest, he wasn't the tallest. It said it, he, was, he was ruddy looking, actually. But 
But look in verse 12, it says, so he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and bright eyed and oh, he says good looking. And the Lord said, and rise, anoint him for this is the one. So in verse 13, it says, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And I love this, you know, to me, it's like God favors the underdog. Amen. You know, yep. he, he, there is, it's almost like even, the, even as a parent, I can relate to this. You know, when our, when our kids go out to play on teams and they, they seem like they're going out to fight another fight or play, as some plays competitive soccer, but, but play against a team that may be stronger. The boys are bigger, they're stronger, they've won more games. There is something about the underdog where, where the crowd gets behind them. It is. Yeah, everyone, everyone loves an underdog. Everyone yeah. loves like the, you know, the possibility of a weaker team or you know, a less accomplished person beating the person who's much, much stronger or much more accomplished and stuff. Yeah, that's, that's like, we do that in England for the English viewers. We have a, a soccer competition called the FA Cup where they let all the underdog teams, like some of the teams, like semi-professional teams, play the big teams. Right, they and just sometimes they beat teams. the big teams uh -huh. because they're more up for it. They're, they're so, that's the biggest they're game of the year They're passionate about them. it. So everyone loves an underdog story. They do. And, and here's the thing. God exalts the humble, doesn't he? He does, right? Man, you know, he says, he, he says this is, I, I forget the address. James 4, 6. Thank you, darling. James 4, 6. He resists the proud, but he exalts the humble. Amen. Yeah. Man, we can, we, we can take heart from that. You know, we may be, it's, it's, it's a good thing to admit where our, the end of ourself is, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but we don't have to stay there. We can praise God. You know, I might make it a position right now, Lord, where you've asked me to do something and I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't feel equipped. I don't feel ready. I don't feel experienced. I don't have the resources to do what you've called me to do. But praise God, I can trust you. Praise God. I thank you, Lord, that, that, that you have put inside of me the mind of Christ. Mm. That you have, you, you say that everything my hand touched prospers. That you have given me gifts, that you have given me talents. Rather than being depressed by our weaknesses and looking at our shortcomings, we can actually rejoice in them because that's an opportunity for God to show himself strong on our behalf. Amen. Sometimes I think it's actually a hindrance. If you're a particularly talented person, you have a lot of, um, in the natural, uh, from the world's point of view, you have a lot of giftings and a lot of, a lot of success and things like that. Sometimes that could be a hindrance mm. because it can be easier to rely on your own strength relying on God's strength. I've got a lot of friends, you know, who have, have come from backgrounds where, you, you know, they got born again later in life and things like that. And they just, I mean, they are just all about God and God's using them because I think it's easier for them to realize it's all God. It's all you, Lord. I've, I couldn't bring anything to the table. You know, before you, I was a down and out basically, and now you're using me. And sometimes I think those of us, you know, I'm not saying us, I shouldn't say us, but people who are like have natural ability, it's harder sometimes for them to trust in God because the natural thing is just to trust in yourself. Mm -hmm. So uh, I like the scripture, 1 Corinthians, um, I think it's in chapter one. It says, God chose the lowly things. You know, God chose the foolish things to confound the wise. I always stand on that scripture. God chose the foolish. Amen. So, <laughs> I can stand on that scripture. God chose the foolish. But it says, God chose the lowly things, you know. Mm. And, you know, I was born on Canby Island, which is a little island in the, uh, the London Thames estuary that's actually below sea level, mm -hmm. officially below sea level. Yeah, they have a huge sea wall that they've built around it to keep the water from coming in. So I was born, and there's no hospitals there, but mm. I had a home birth and um, I was born in, on an island that's below sea level. And now we live- On your mum's bed. On my mum's bed, <laughs> I guess TMI, but I guess so, yeah. That's, I think that's where I was born. I was born in the house. And now we live on top of a mountain top, on top that's of right. 6,500 feet. So God chose the lowly things. And now I live on a, a mountain top. That always makes, me, <laughs> always makes me laugh. But I can definitely stand the scripture, God chose the foolish. So he chose me because I, I can do foolish. Right? <laughs> you, yeah, he can. <laughs> so when you realize, you know what, it's all God in you. Anything good coming out of you, Anything that, you know, is God. And when we start relying on God, that's humility. Humility is, you know what, God, without you, I'm nothing. Without you, I could do nothing. I could achieve nothing. But praise God, I'm not without you. Now I have you living on the inside of me, Christ in me, the hope and glory. And then you can realize, you know what? Everything good coming out of me is God. And that Amen. keeps us humble. We in our weakness, that. God is strong. Amen. Amen. So we're going to look at some of these characters here. We've been talking about David. Now, David, um, I, I love David particularly because the Lord says, he's a man after my own heart. And you know, this is even more powerful when we start to look at the life of David. He was crowned king as, as a young man, but there was a period of time before he really saw anything come to pass. Mm -hmm. You know, he went, he was crowned king, and then what happened? He went out to, to looking after the sheep again, right? There was a period of time before uh, David saw that come to pass, the, the manifestation of that 
kingdom, kingship, kingdom. whatever kingdom. it was, whatever you call it. You know, he didn't look like a king. Although he had been crowned king by the prophet, he didn't look like a king. He went back out to doing his day job. Mm -hmm. And there was a period of time before he saw, saw that came to pass. But as you look through David's life, you know, the fact that God called him a man after my own heart is even more powerful when you considered some of David's mistakes. Sometimes, especially in the realm of ministry, it's very easy to discount ourselves or just to cast aside somebody else because they've made a mistake in an area. Mm -hmm. You know, and God is not, he, he doesn't have a perfect vessel to use, but he's looking for men and women that are after his own heart. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. And so, um, I want to look, this is in uh, 2 Samuel um, chapter 11. And this is David and Bathsheba. And it, it says, uh, I'm just going to jump right into verse 11. It says, It happened in the spring of the year at the time when the kings go out to battle. And David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Ramah. But David remained in Jerusalem. That was a mistake. This was one of David's downfalls. He found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time, right? At the time of year when kings are supposed to go out to battle, David stayed home in the palace. And look, look, look in verse two what happened. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman and someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messages and took, and took her and she came to him and lay with her and she was cleansed from her impurity and returned to her house. But she conceived and she said, I am with child. So in other words, he's out there on the palace roof mm -hmm. when he should have been out of battle and he's eyeing up the neighbor's wife. Not good. Not good. And you know what? It says here that he, he arose from his bed in, in the evening. So it sounds like, you know, we're reading between the lines, but if you arose from your bed in the evening, that means you've been in bed all day. So it sounds like David had so much success at this point, he wasn't needed on the battlefield or, or he, th he thought he wasn't needed on the battlefield. So he stayed home. And not only did he stay home, he stayed in bed. He's, he's acting like a teenager, <laughs> staying yeah. in bed, staying in bed until evening. Man, so it's, he, e it's easier to raise the dead than raise, raise teenagers, teenagers from the bed. So it sounds like he stayed in bed until evening, until he was in bed right. all day. And then he gets up and basically, you know, the old, the old wives saying, the old wives saying, the old wives tale, the old saying, you know, the devil makes use of idle hands. Mm -hmm. It's almost like he was bored. He wasn't out to battle. He'd been in bed all day. He gets up, he's looking around. It's almost like he's, like you said, he's in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. But you can, you can avoid that by, you know what, doing the Lord's work and actually making sure you're in the center of God's will and not mm -hmm. just hanging around doing nothing. Hanging around mm -hmm. doing nothing is, is a dangerous place to be in, I think, because it's like, you need right. to be doing something. You need to have some sort of purpose. Right. You know? And this is, this is partly why, you know, we need to be so steadfast in our relationship with the Lord. See, David had gotten off track. Even though he, he had been crowned king and he'd, he'd been, so, you know, he'd, he'd killed Goliath, right? He'd been through some battles. He'd gotten in, himself into, into the palace. I mean, he had some great accomplishments but he'd kind of gotten a little bit slack and you know, maybe, maybe even um, stopped relying somewhat on the Lord and started to rely on his accomplishments or his talents. I mean, I'm, I mean you could say I'm reading into this a little bit, but whatever it was, he, he got off track and found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. And what the consequence of, of that decision was huge. He ended up committing adultery, having an illegitimate child, and then to make it worse, to cover up his mistakes, he called Uriah, Bathsheba's um, husband, back from battle, tried to get him to go to sleep with his wife so he could cover up the fact that David was really the one that got her pregnant. Right. And Uriah was such an honorable man. He says, I can't go sleep in my house while my troops are out on the battlefield. So David, at the end of the day, had Uriah murdered. Yeah. Man, this was a, a whole evil web of deceit. And that he had to lie, to lie, to lie, to cover up another lie. David found himself somewhere he didn't want to be. But, you know, the prophet, the prophet came back again and he, and he challenged, Prophet Samuel came back and he challenged David on this and brought some clarity and David repented. You see, and this is why it's so powerful when the scripture said that David is a man after God's own heart. David made some terrible mistakes. It cost people their life but yet he was still a man after God's own heart. And it came back to the fact that he was repentant. And you could say, well, do you think God knew all of those things that David was gonna do before he picked him to be king? Well, yeah, he's God, right? He sees the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. 
You know, he picked David knowing that the, these mistakes were going to happen. Now, he didn't cause those mistakes. Right. David had a choice, but God knew what David's decision was going to be before he made it, and he picked him anyway. That's, That's good. powerful. That's hope for us. That is. It's hope for anyone. That so. is. And it's not just David. I mean, there are plenty of examples in the scriptures of, of uh, men and women of God that made mistakes, but God did not cast them aside. Amen. So if you feel like you've made a mistake in your life that's just too big, that's just, you know, unrestorable, that you can't move past it, you're only seeing yourselves and your past history through man's eyes. But God sees your heart. If you have made a mistake and you are truly repentant, God is the God of restoration. Amen. Amen. And He does not throw us out like yesterday's old newspaper, right. right? He still has a plan for your life and it's good and it's God. Amen. And so He's, you know, it, it says in the scriptures that the gifts and callings of God are without reproach, without repentance. The talents and the gifts and the abilities that God and the calling of God on your life still stands today even if you've made a mistake. But repentance and heart is the key to moving into the things that God has for us. Amen. Romans That's eleven twenty nine. 29, that mm -hmm. is Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, that the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. And mm. that's the truth right there. God had a, a calling on David's life. And even though he made those mistakes, and I think even worse than the mistake he made, the way he covered up his mistake, even though we went through all that, because he was repentant, he said, you know what, against you, Lord, and you only have I sinned. He was genuinely repentant to God for the mistakes he'd made and for the things he'd done. He was genuinely repentant, and therefore God was able to use him uh, just like before. So it's powerful to think mm -hmm. that, you know what, God is looking for, some, you know, for, for us to have a pure heart towards him, not necessarily perfect, but a, a, a pure heart towards him in terms of, of being honest with him and open. And that's what I love about David's story. Even though he made all these mistakes, he was so honest and open to God. He was so transparent. He was mm -hmm. like, God knows it anyway, and I'm just going to repent and be honest to God. Mm -hmm. When we try and hide things from God, that's never a good move. Right, exactly, exactly. And um, let's look at, this is in, um, in, in Luke uh, 15. This is the, the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. I love this story. Verse 11, it says, Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and wasted his possessions with prodigal um, living. But when he had spent all, he spent everything, there arose a severe famine in the land and he began to want. And he said to himself, I'm going to go back and see if my father is going to take me back. I'd be better off feeding my father's pigs, if you like, being the lowest in my father's household than where I'm at right now. And, um, you know, this is, this is a powerful story because the son had basically gone to his, gone to his father and said, I'm not going to wait till you die. I'm going to, I want my, my share of the inheritance now. Man, that's offensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, any parent, that's, that's offensive to start with. But then he went off and he just spent it. He went crazy. He had the ultimate college party, right? <laughs> riotous living. <laughs> riotous living. I've heard some people say he, he spent it on riotous living and parties and, and the rest he wasted. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Okay, so he, he didn't even spend it on anything that was useful. He just lived it up, mm -hmm. right? Until eventually he came to the end of himself. But this is what the heart of repentance does. You see, he realized the error of his ways and he decided he's going to go back and, and apologize to his father. And um, he, he says in verse, verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so his heart truly was of, of repentance. But look at the restoration in this. Verse 20, And when he, um, he rose, went to his father, and when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him while he was still a long way off. What that tells me is that his father was there, maybe at the edge of his property line, at the edge of his boundary, looking out across the fields. He was looking for his son. He was there. He saw his son in the distance while he was still a long way off. And he was so excited. You know, his father could have been angry. He could have been upset. He could have been deeply offended. He could have rejected his son. The son was risking rejection mm -hmm. coming back to the father. But the father, the whole time his son was missing, he was looking for him. Mm. He'd already forgiven him before his son had even apologized. That's huge. That's huge, right? This is the grace and the restoration of God. And as we, we move on down there, he says, look at, look at the father's response. And, the, you know, the, the son goes through his, 
his um, apology here in verse 22. But the, the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Bring out the ring on his hand and the sandals on his feet. Bring out the fatted calf and kill it and let us be eaten, be merry. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found and they began to be merry. And you know, we don't have time to go into all of the different things in this, but the, the, the different attributes that he gave back to his son there was a, was a picture of restoration. He put a mm -hmm. robe on him. A robe in scripture is a picture of identity. He mm -hmm. gave him back his identity. He put sandals on his feet and honored him. He put a ring on his finger. That ring was, it was like a seal of the kingdom, mm -hmm. a, a, a place of authority. He gave him back his identity and his honor and his authority. And I believe that if we come to the Lord with a, with a heart of repentance, he will restore back to us even the things that the locusts have eaten away. And the end of your days will be even more glorious than the beginning. Amen. That neat. Praise God. We're out of time. Do you want to pray Amen. Before, we, before we go? Amen. Father God, I just thank you that your heart towards us is only good, mm. that you only have good things for us. And Lord, we come before you in all of our weakness and our humility. And we say, Lord, let, we want you to have your way in our life. We lay our, our, our hopes and our dreams and our talents before you that you might use us, that we might become vessels yeah. for your kingdom, for your glory. And yeah. Lord, we receive your forgiveness. We, we come to you in repentance for those times when we've messed up and Lord, we receive your restoration. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you that it is because of your goodness and your holiness that we have, we have a future. That Lord, that you say that you have plans for our lives that are good and only good. And regardless of what's happened before, Lord, we agree with the plans and the purposes that you have for our life. And we receive them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I believe there's people watching that think, you know what, you've just, you've done too much. You've disappointed God too much. You've gone too far from God. And, and we're here to tell you, you know what? That's not true. You know, if you turn to God now, God will accept you. God loves you. He's already forgiven you. He's already accepted you. All you've got to do is turn to Him. Stop running and mm. uh, turn to Him. There's nothing you've done that is, that is too big for God, praise God. So come mm. back to God. You can run, but you can't hide from That's the love right. of God. Amen. You can't hide from the love <laughs> of God. And God is calling you back. Mm. So right now, wherever you are, just give your heart back to the Lord. And he, he's just like this father in the prodigal son. He is looking out, waiting for you to turn back. And he's not going to start pointing all the things you've done wrong. No, he's already forgiven you. He's going to hug on you and love on you. And you can, you can carry on your relationship with God, praise God. So if that's you, turn back to God because he loves you. Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, thanks for watching. We look forward to seeing you next time. And until next time, don't just live a normal life when you can live the abundant life. To order your copy of this teaching, visit our website, teradesministries.com. Hey, I want to thank the partners of Teradez Ministries. Thank you for your support. You know what? By your financial support, we're able to go out and touch the world for Jesus. We're seeing people's lives turned around. We're seeing people healed. We're seeing people set free. We're seeing people born again. And your gifts are enabling us to do that. So we want to thank you and thank you on behalf of all the people we're touching, praise God. Thank you for your partnership. We appreciate you. We're praying for you. We know you're going to increase as you sow seed into this ministry. So we're praying for you regularly. Thank you for your partnership. We love you all.